Well, good morning, Faith Life Church. Glad to have you out today on this uh, winter morning here in Ohio. And wherever you're at, glad to have you. Pal, let's give it up for Pal joining us live right now. Our Pal campus, online campus, uh, people everywhere. I hope it's warm where you're at. So it's warm in here. Kingdom is good. And we're going to have a great time. So uh, get your pencils and paper. You know how I say that and I make fun of myself because I don't think people use pencils anymore. Uh, but remember school? How many people do I have here that remember in school? Number two pencil. Okay. I went to a corporate meeting. I mean, it's a big company meeting this week, and they actually gave us number two pencils and paper. It's the first time that's happened I can ever remember. Anyway, it's good. And anyway, so get your, however you take notes, out. We got a lot to cover today, and I have a question to ask. First off, how many have spent some time in the book of, let's see here, what's a good topic here? Chronicles. I had no takers last service. Anyone read Chronicles this week? Over here. There's one. Two? Is that it? Okay. It is in the Bible. <laughs> uh, you know, it parallels Kings. It talks about uh, the old uh, kings and different things. We're going to talk about kings today. How many have heard of Jehoshaphat? Yes? Really? That's the lowest amount of cheers I've heard of the last two services. Really, you've heard of Jehoshaphat? Okay, thank you. And what kingdom did he rule? Judah. And of course, if you're new here, Israel was 10 tribes in the north and two in the south. And for you, like trivia type stuff, who was the king of the northern kingdom at that same time? Ahab and his beautiful wife. Jezebel, that's right. We're going to talk about them today, so grab your Bible. We'll be right here in chapter 20 in a second, but I'm going to talk about Jehoshaphat for a minute. Jehoshaphat was a righteous king uh, in Judah. He did a lot to bring the nation of Judah back into conformity with the law in his earlier days when he launched out at first, but he became very wealthy and he began to compromise uh, one of the biggest compromises he made was allowing, or not saying allowing, they did it on purpose. His son married Ahab and Jezebel's daughter. Uh, I, they, they wanted to come together into agreement, maybe for protection, but that was a bad move. Ahab is not a good guy. Jezebel's definitely not a good influence, right? And so it came to pass that Ahab wanted to launch a battle against another kingdom, and he asked Jehoshaphat to join him. God said, do not help Ahab in this battle, but you can guess what he did. He helped. And after he got back from the battle, by the way, Ahab was killed in that battle. So after Jehoshaphat got back from the battle, he was confronted by a prophet who confronted him and said, you know, why are you helping the, the, the evil people? Basically, here's the actual quote. He says to Josephat, the wrath of God is all upon you. The wrath of God. So God is not happy with Josephat. But the prophet said, because you were righteous in your earlier days and did so much for the kingdom of Judah, you know, God is not going to destroy you or whatever. Uh, but he repented and began to seek the Lord and then he found out that something else was going on. A very large, huge army was on their way to wipe out the nation of Judah. We'll pick the story up in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse number 2. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you. They're already almost here. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord and to proclaim a fast for all of Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. They came from every part of the nation. Then Jehoshaphat stood up at the temple and led a prayer for this situation. I'm not going to read the prayer, but it's quite lengthy. At the end of it, though, it kind of gives you the inside view of what is actually happening. Jehoshaphat says... For we have no power to face this vast 
army. Now, he's not talking about we have no power with God's help. He means in the natural, there is no way we're going to be able to defend ourselves against this huge army. Then he goes on and says, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you, on the Lord. So if you're facing anything huge today, something bigger than you, you can't see a way out, this is your day. Thank you that you're here. Because today you're going to learn, today's topic, I call it the shift, meaning that you can't keep staring at your problems and expect to win. You have to shift your attention, your perspective to what God says. And Jehoshaphat says, our eyes are on you. He learned his lesson. My eyes are on you, Lord. That is your confession. What does God say about this situation? And we're going to learn what happened here. Now, after the prayer, a prophet of God was there and began to prophesy to the nation. And we'll pick that up right here, verse number 15. This prophet says, Listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours but God's. Underline, do something to mark that in your Bible. Tomorrow, march down against them. Stop everything. I thought they're outnumbered. God's saying to march against them? Well, let's finish the story. They will be climbing up at the passes, and you'll find them at the end of the gorge, the desert trail. So he's telling them where they're at. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions. Stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Now, that sounds almost identical to Ephesians chapter 6 that says, put on the whole armor of God, and when you've done everything to stand, stand. And to stand on what? Is he talking about the dirt? You know, stand on the dirt? No, he's talking about stand on what God says. In fact, if you examine every piece of the spiritual armor Paul teaches in Ephesians 6, all of them are around the Word of God. Every one of them is the Word of God. So put that on everywhere and stand on what God says. Now, this is important because you may think in a situation that is standing against you that you have to engage and fight it uh, by yourself. That is not true. How many have kids here? If your kid has a problem, your child has a problem, how many parents would agree that's my problem? If your child's in trouble, how many agree you're, you know, your child, that's, that's your problem? Now, God is no different. You are his people. And so it says this in Philippians, be anxious for how much? Well, then what's going to happen? Be anxious for nothing but through prayer and petition. Let your request be known to God and with thanksgiving, and then the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Guard from what? Fear. Whose battle is it? It's God's. Give it to God. He has the answer. It's the same thing he told them. Give it to God. God is your answer. He is, it's his battle. He will, he will take care of it. You have to walk it out, but he'll take care of it. And so we need to remember this, but something happens here that we're really focusing on in this series. And by the way, today is the first session of a brand new series. It'll last two more weekends. And I call it, again, what I call it? This. What is it? Say it again. Shift what? What you're looking at. Right? The shift. Something happens here. This series, The Shift, is the power of praise and worship. How many know when you're in trouble, you don't really feel like praising? (laughs) The devil doesn't want you to praise, that's for sure. We're going to look at that today, though. So here's what happened. This prophet says, you don't have to bat, this isn't your battle. 18, this this is the so awesome scripture in this whole story. Verse 18, Jehoshaphat when the prophet said, it's, it's over, God's taking care of it, he bowed with his face to the ground. All the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. Let me kind of make this clear to you. There was no hope. No hope. 
The nation will be lost. The temple destroyed. God's people destroyed. There's no hope. And then God says, stand still. You'll not have to fight this battle. It's my battle. The response was an immediate worship of God. When you have a revelation of how big God is, and it's by revelation. People think worship is something that you do, like it's, you know, we have praise and worship. It's time to worship. That is not true. Worship comes out of your heart. It is not an action. It's a response. It is a response of the revelation of God. When you understand and see him for who he is, what he does, what he's done, and you realize what you realize, there is nothing else to do but worship. It's like, whoa. They just fell down like, whoo. Have you ever been in a worship service or a church service where, you know, it gets down the road and people, you kind of step into that flow and it gets quiet? You know, there was singing and dancing, and now it's just like this silent presence of God. That's worship. It's a heartfelt response to God. It's not something that you do out of duty. It's not something you plan on doing out of rote memory. It is a response to who he is. And so here they're facing this huge problem, and God says, I'll take care of it. Whoa. I remember in a human sense, back when we were first married, I didn't, uh, really, I didn't know much back then. But anyway, I, 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 didn't, I, I didn't keep up with my taxes for a couple of years, and I ended up finally filing taxes after a couple of years of not filing, and you owe $5,000. Back then, 43 years ago, whatever it was, that was a lot of money. It's a lot of money today, right? And I didn't have that money at all. I didn't have a chance, really, of having that money. And I had gone on a trip. Uh, we went to see my parents here in Ohio. We were in Tulsa at the time. And, uh, you know, my, we were talking about business and stuff. And I mentioned to my dad, well, my dad, you know, he disappears and he comes back with a check for $5,000. Unexpected. And my dad, if you remember the stories, my dad's not a believer, but he was generous. He, was a, he, had, he had kind of a streak of generosity. And at that moment, I felt helpless in the sense that I had no answer for that. When my dad walked up and paid that, my immediate response was just to grab him and hug him and just thank him, thanksgiving. It wasn't something like, okay, it's time to thank your dad. You understand what I'm saying? It's, hey, it's time to thank your dad. You know, no, see, no, that's not it. It was an immediate response of hugging this guy. It's like, just, you know, like saying, you're awesome. You're awesome. You know, just, it's, it's a grateful response and that's what worship really is. Now, let's go on in the story here. So then, after they bowed down and worship, the Levites began to sing with a loud voice. But what do they sing? Are they worshiping? No, it says they praised the Lord. We need to understand the difference of praise and worship. So they praised the Lord, it says, and uh, with a very loud voice. So... Let me find out where it says that. Just bow down, just fell in worship, and then, yeah, they stood up and praised a loud voice. Then, Joseph, at verse 21, spoke to the people. Then he, after he spoke to the people, he appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him, not worship, praise him, for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army. So he put these guys that were singing out in front of, of the army. Now remember, they're not going to enter this battle. God already told them to stand. But he puts these people to sing praises out in front. And here's what they sing. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. And here's the, here's the difference of praise. Praise is a response of what God does. So they're praise thanking God for, fill the blank in. Okay, praise, worship is who he, oh, oh, you're, oh, is a, oh my goodness. Praise is praising God for what he does or what he's done. And so they're thanking him. Now, as they began to sing and praise, God then set ambushes for the army, and they defeated this innumerable army, which is a very key aspect that you need to understand. You want to get God involved with whatever you're involved with, praise and worship. Now, here's, why, here's how it happens, though. Praise declares 
God's doings, what he does, what he's done. Praise declares and mainly declares it to you. So we start our service with praise and offering because praises declares if you're sick, you're singing God heals. If you have a need, you are declaring and singing that God meets needs. See, praise lifts him up, as we heard in the song. It lifts him up in your eyes. It sets him in a place of honor in your eyes. Then next, your response is worship. Praise sets him up as your answer. You're reviewing. You're talking about who he is to you, and you're praising him for what he's done, and then you worship. So there's a difference. So he started out praising because it builds God up in our, our mind. Now, worship, most people think worship is time for the slow songs and, uh, you know, the more quieted atmosphere. And praise is kind of more lively. Praise is only more lively because it's celebratory. You're celebrating God. You're celebrating what he does. You're celebrating what he's done. You're celebrating him. But worship is not a slow song. As I said, worship comes out of the heart. But let me add something to this. Romans chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, verse number one, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your, what's the next word? What is it? Say it again. Spiritual act of worship. Some versions say reasonable act of worship, or some say true and proper worship. Spiritual. Let me paraphrase. The greatest act of worship is obedience. Worship is obedience. Let me, let me give you a definition to help you here. The definition in the dictionary of worship is this. To regard with great or extravagant respect. Extravagant respect, extravagant honor, and extravagant devotion. Now, if you have extravagant respect and honor and devotion, there's going to be obedience that honors and follows that, correct? Your greatest act of worship is obedience. If you don't obey, it tells me you don't honor, you're not devoted, right? And certainly the Bible says, I mean, dictionary says extravagant respect, extravagant honor and devotion. So to paraphrase, it'd be like, whatever you need, God, whatever I can do, whatever, you know, to honor you, whatever. You follow this? I mean, it's extravagant. Extravagant devotion, honor, respect is worship. So God uh, says here in Romans chapter 12, Paul is saying, in view of God's mercy... Now, the entire book of Romans is talking about the plan of salvation and how you have been delivered into the kingdom of God. And so in view of God's mercy towards you in his plan to bring you out of darkness into light, in view of that, what should your response be? To offer your bodies as living sacrifices. What does that mean? It means do what he says. Offer yourselves in extreme devotion, in respect and honor, God, whatever you need, I'm here, whatever it is. I honor you, I respect you. You have, through your mercy, changed my life, set my path on a different path. You have given me life from death. I mean, whatever it is, like, you know, we worship, but whatever it is, whoa, whatever, just tell me. You need money, tell me, whatever you need. Hey, I got it. Just let me, let me be involved. I want, to, I want to lay my life down as a sacrifice. In, uh, this, is my, this is my spiritual act of worship. It's not a slow song. It's not goosebumps. It's obedience. You want to make God happy? Obey. Now, we all enjoy the anointing. But you want to, you want to experience some great anointing? Be in obedience. Obedience is the highest form of worship. Worship is a stance, a holy reverence, an extravagant reverence of God. 
Now, I don't stop to worship. Like, okay, now it's time to, you know, it's our worship service, time to worship. No, no. I mean, we do that. We, we come into praise and worship, and, the, of course, God inhabits the praises of his people, the Bible says. But we don't turn a switch on and decide, I'm going to worship because my life is worship. You understand? My life is worship. I don't choose to, okay, it's time to worship. Because you can act like you're worshiping, but if your heart is not involved, you're not worshiping. See, your heart is a response to who God is. You know, I pray that Paul said to Ephesians 1st chapter, I pray that your eyes would be opened to this glorious inheritance that you have and who you are in Christ and the power that brought Jesus out of the grave. And he says that your eyes, revelation. We sang that song today, you know, about the angels singing and we sing. And it's, it's awesome. But as we're standing there, you know, eh, I wonder how many people have the revelation of what they're saying. It's like, oh, my goodness. If you had the revelation of what you're speaking with your mouth, who he is, oh, my goodness. It's like, Whoa. Right? They're, oh, my goodness. Every dominion, you know, there's no name. I mean, oh, my goodness, you know. How did I get here? How did I get this body? How am I living? You know, I didn't come here on my own. I show up here on the earth. I got a body. Look how it works. I mean, look at creation. I mean, God, you're amazing. I mean, how, how could this happen? You're worthy of my devotion, my respect, my honor. There is no one like you. I mean, I mean, it's just, you just poof, Right? Psalms 100, shout for joy to the Lord all the earth, worship the Lord of the gladness. Now, here we understand, worship means to serve the Lord of the gladness. Worship, serve the Lord of the gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. Here's, here's why we can worship. We, he made us. We are his. We are his people the sheep of his pasture, which tells us he's going to take care of us. He's going to lead us to green pastures, still waters. He is responsible for us. He's got this. We worship him. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. See, praise always has a reason. Praise says, for the Lord is good. We praise him because his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations to me. So praise declares declares what God does. Worship responds to who he is. Making a difference? All right. When you praise God, you cannot stay in fear very long. Your attention has been changed from the problem. You are declaring the answer. Meaning that if you are sick and you are praising God that he heals... Or if you have a need and you're praising God, he is faithful and loyal to his word that he provides everything. See, as you're declaring, praise declares, reminds you, lifts him high above the problem, you cannot stay in fear and praise at the same time. So if you find yourself in fear, you need to shift your attention from the problem to how awesome God is. Just stop and begin to praise him for the past victories he gave you. Begin to praise him for what his word says about you, what his promises say. And as you do so, there's going to be a shift of your attention from the problem to the answer, and you're going to walk out feeling invigorated and hopeful. Demons hate praise and worship. They cannot stand in the presence of for if God inhabits the praises of his people, demons scurry from the presence of his people when they praise. 1 Samuel chapter 16 is a story about King Saul. As you know, he was disqualified, fired, terminated, right? From his position as king. And so Samuel went to anoint a new king, as you know, as King David, here in 1 Samuel 16, 13. So Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed David in the presence of his brothers. I'm sure they loved that. (laughs) And from that day on, from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Now it says the spirit of God had departed from Saul. And an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. In a sense, God did not send a spirit to him. 
God simply withdrew his spirit, which gave Satan jurisdiction over him, and a demon could torment Saul. So Saul's attendants, I'm going to kind of paraphrase a little bit, said, hey, get someone that can pray, play the lyre. It's like a harp. When this demon, he's being, Saul's tormented in mind and spirit, we'll play some of this music. It'll help him. And so King Saul said, no, you know, go find someone. Now, this is before, I mean, obviously Saul is, when Saul was terminated, he was still in position. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, Samuel said, you can no longer be king, but yet he was still in the palace and he still was acting as king. But God was in the middle of, of changing that. So Saul is still there. Saul said to his attendants, now again, God withdrew his spirit. Uh, he said, find someone who plays well and bring him to me. And one of the servants answered, this is verse 18, I've seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. He's a brave man, a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine looking man. All of those things are nice, but mean nothing. It's the next phrase that you're looking for. <laughs> this is for someone in hiring your next employee. Someone's needing, I just, wanted, I just felt to say that. And the Lord is with him. We just found out he was anointed, right? The Lord is with him because if you're going to have anointed music, someone who is anointed needs to play it, Right? Okay. Verse 23. Now, whenever the spirit of the enemy, of the demon, would come and torment Saul, David would take up his lyre and play. Then relief would come to Saul. He would feel better. And the evil spirit would what? Leave him. This is a powerful truth that you need to understand. Praise and worship is a weapon in your hand. When you feel depressed, you need to praise God. You need an answer, you need to praise God. Worship will follow, but you need to praise God, remind yourself of what he does, what he's done, his word, what his promises say, and you need to declare it as you praise him and give him thanks for who he is. Demons scatter. Psalms 18.1. Tell me if this is praise or worship. Now, this, this chapter of 18 here is when uh, King Saul was chasing David, trying to kill him, remember? And... Uh, David escaped his hands. And so David wrote this psalm. I love you, Lord. You're my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. My shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. What is it? Praise or worship? Praise. It's praise. Exactly. I call to the Lord who is worthy of my praise. And I have been saved from my enemies. That's praise. He's thanking God. He's praising God. And that's what it sounds like. So praise and worship. Again, worship is a response to who he is. It's amazing. I mean, it's just awesome. Praise is remembering what he does, what his word says, thanking him for that. And it lifts him high. It lifts him up in your spirit. It sets your attention off of the problem onto what he says. Now, I'm going to change gears for a second. I've got a video I want to show you. It's from 2019. It's an older one, but I want to jump off of that with a couple comments after we get back with this video. I'll be right back. I had gone to the doctor and found out that I had um, a polyp that needed removed and ended up being a big deal. And they said, um, you have stage four cancer and here's what we recommend. And so one of it was doing chemo for six months and then um, see what happens after that. While I was in that process is when I would be laying on the couch resting. After chemo treatments, I would be exhausted and then started watching Fixing the Money thing. I was looking on Christian TV and started listening and I'm like, this is, this is what we've been looking for. A year previous to her having her bout with her health issues, I felt that one morning God told me I'm to have a kingdom business, and I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about because I thought it was God's business, but it kept coming back that I am to have a kingdom business. When she started listening to Pastor Gary and I would come home from work, she said, this is what God is saying. 
about a kingdom business. I literally had stopped dreaming. I had dreams in my heart that I'd just given up because, well, when you're just on the hamster wheel and you're working as hard as you can and nothing's really changing, how are you going to dream for anything more? And that's exactly where we were. I hated debt, and so I would have just loved to find a way to fix this money thing. Just a title caught my attention. And then when I heard he was in New Albany and, you know, it was like, there's a possibility here. This is our 27th year in business as an excavating business. And our business is always seasonal. It slows down in the winter time. And we always struggled with even making payroll and things like that during January, February, March, when winter was at its worst. And so when we started listening to Pastor Gary and the things that he would say, we just felt like, man, this is, this is something that we really have to get connected to. Like Gary says, you gotta be a spiritual scientist and, and dig for yourself and find why or whatever. And I remember I, I read the scriptures and would take the scriptures that he would teach with and I would, I would look them up and see if he was right. And all made sense to me. One of the biggest things we've learned is the authority that God has given us in the earth realm. That's what we were lacking was the knowledge of the authority that we actually have in the earth realm. When I went back for a checkup after I had gone through all my chemo and was kind of over that and went back for a checkup, the doctor looked at me, shook his head and he said, I am amazed. There is absolutely no evidence of any disease in your body. We came to the provision conference uh, that first time in 2016, and from there it just grew from there. We were actually part of another church and were very involved there. And after coming to provision and just learning more and then occasionally coming Saturday nights, we finally looked at each other and we're like, we have to go there and learn from these people. We were so hungry and wanted so much to learn more about these principles because if it's the kingdom, why, we want it. And we knew about the kingdom, but we didn't understand the kingdom. I think it was in 18 when we went to Pastor Gary's Financial Revolution Conference in Atlanta. And while we were on the way down, one of our guys had an accident with one of the trucks. So we there had the opportunity to sow a seed. And we sowed a seed, and this was in the middle of winter. This was in January. We went on to Florida for vacation then, and before we came home, we had the cash to buy a very good used truck just like what we needed for the business and that was our first big experience, experience with, with sowing a seed and seeing a harvest very quickly even in the middle of winter and that was very very unusual for our business and for us to experience we've always been tithers we've always tithed but we didn't understand what it means to sow a seed and expect a harvest. And we grew up as farmers' kids, and we didn't understand that, but. It's been a family business with mm -hmm. one or two other people coming in to help us. So we're just a small family business. But as we have learned these kingdom principles, are, we've just seen our profit margins go way up and just uh, blessed with good jobs that are profitable one of the key things that we really stress people that work for us is being intentional with our integrity, mm -hmm. doing what we say, and making sure the people get what they expected to get. And so excellence is a very high priority for us. And people notice. Um, it's very unusual if we don't have comments from our customers in the office that the guys were very, very good at what they did and did a great job for them and that kind of thing. So I'm very blessed. We, I went from one dozer to we now we have two hoes. 
We got skid steers, we've got dump trucks, scraper and pan, we build ponds. In, in the year 2018, we were so blessed, we paid cash for more things and we paid off more debt in that one year than we even dreamed of paying off in three years time. And 2018 was absolutely the most phenomenal year we've ever experienced ever. I mean, by a large amount. I mean, financially, it was just way more than we ever dreamed of doing in one, expanding in one year. It was just amazing how God came through in that. There's fresh opportunity out there. And I keep hearing God say, stay, just stay on assignment. Just stay on assignment, you know, walk in what you've been made to do and you just live it out. People will see the difference. And, and who doesn't want different when it's better? Wouldn't you prefer prospering versus being in poverty? And that's, I think that's God's heart. I thank God for fixing the money thing because that's, that was hope for us. Yes, amen. Johnny and Ruth attend Powell, so if they're there, they may be on vacation. It's winter, I don't know. But hey, if you're over at Powell, great story. That was 19. We've checked up. These things keep happening. And the reason I wanted to show their story is that, uh, as you know, we're building our camp and digging, digging over there. He's been helping some over there at the camp. And he drives from Plain City over there to, to do that. And why, why would he do that? Because he's grateful. He's thankful. I mean, you know, he wants to tell people about the kingdom of God, how it works, right? And that's, that's what we're all about. And so it can work for you too. It can work for you too. If you give us a year, I would say, learn how these stories happen. Don't just come to church and go, yeah, that's great. I know that for when you first come, you can't see yourself in those pictures. I know, I've been, I've been there in the past. I know, you can clap, but you can't see yourself there. But as you begin to learn the kingdom, all of a sudden you begin to realize it's based on laws, and it's based on laws. Anyone can do that. It changes your perspective. Most Christians have been taught to uh, believe that God chooses to do things or chooses not to do things, which isn't true. Uh, He gave you the kingdom, and so learn how the kingdom operates. It is yours, meaning that you need to learn how it works, and you can apply those laws just like a farmer does. He uses those laws. Uh, He can set his own uh, amount of harvest, that's up to him. So anyway, I want to encourage you today to do that. So praise and worship is a weapon in your hand. And praising God re, re, um, refocuses or shifts your attention, which is what has to happen to escape the enemy's plan to take you down or out or stop you in your tracks. Now, as you know, I want to mention this. We're going to receive our uh, tithes and offerings here in just a bit. But I want to stand, if you'll stand with me for a second, I want to talk to you on a personal level. If by chance you come from a religious background or you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, you know, we always carry a bunch of baggage with us from religious stuff, but it's not that complicated. Jesus paid the legal price necessary for God to move you into his kingdom. And it is a kingdom, a government. And He makes you a citizen, the Bible says in Ephesians 2.19. You become a citizen. I say this all the time. Citizens have legal rights. And you have to know how those laws work to take advantage of them. If someone is stealing something out of your house, you would call the police and enforce the law. And so you need to know how the laws work in the kingdom to enjoy the benefits of the kingdom. That's why I say give us a year. But your first step is to become a citizen. The Bible says whoever calls on the name of Jesus has a legal right to become a citizen and a member of God's household. Jesus paid the price, but you must ratify it personally, your free will. You must give God the permission to bring you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, and then begins your journey of learning how the kingdom works. So I'd like you to bow your heads with me right now, everyone here in the auditorium, online or over at Powell. And I just want to ask you, if you've never called on the name of Jesus, or you're asking, how do these stories happen? I sure would like to have stories like this. Great. Asking questions is the first step. I want you to ask questions. But right now, I want to make sure that you're in the kingdom, so you have a legal right to the the, the power and the grace of God that allow these stories to take place. And if you would say, "I, I don't know how this happens, but... 
I need to call on the name of Jesus. Yes, include me in, in this prayer. Anyone that's here, you say, I want to be part of this prayer. We're all going to pray out loud. I'd like you just to raise your hand really high right now and say, Pastor, include me in this prayer. Today is the day I'm making a decision. I am going to learn how the kingdom operates. I'm going to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I want to know how these stories keep happening. Every time I come to Faith Life, I hear these stories over and over again. How does that happen? If that's you or you're here, or you're at Pal, you're online, stick your hand up right now and say, include me in this prayer. Hands up, hands up, hands up. I see hands up, hands up, hands up. And who wouldn't want the goodness of God? He's not mad at you. He's trying to get his goodness to you. So pray this prayer, all of you out loud, especially those that raise their hands, say this out loud. Say, Father, you said in your Bible that if I call on the name of Jesus, that you'll receive me, make me brand new on the inside, fill me with your Holy Spirit, teach me how your kingdom works, how it operates. I need that. Today I receive that. Today I make Jesus the Lord and the Savior of my life. And every promise is now mine. And now your goodness is mine. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You can have a seat. We're going to receive our tithes and offerings in just a minute. But first, I want to give you an update on the camp. I'm going to let Pastor Tim talk for a second, and then we're going to bring an update on the camp. Uh, if you don't know, uh, we have a tremendous campground we purchased last fall, and we are rehabbing it as we speak. But let's take a look at Pastor Tim. He'll explain more about it. Hey everybody, it's Tim here. I want to give you a little more information on something you've probably heard about. We purchased a camp. And so I'm so excited. I grew up personally going to youth camp every year. We've done youth camps here for 20 some years, but some of the most powerful moments I ever experienced with the Lord, it was at youth camp. And I believe that's because it's a time when you get away from your phone, you get away from your computer, you get away from so many of the distractions that plague us and give God an opportunity to speak. In fact, he always wants to speak but many times we're not listening because we live busy, busy lives. And so I wanna tell you a little bit more about exactly how we're gonna use the camp. And we wanna make sure that the camp is a place for all ages. It becomes a place where we can get together, where we can hear God, where we can grow, where we can listen and uh, really be strengthened in our faith. So a few things that we're planning on doing one, we really want to do family camps to help restore and encourage families to build deeper and stronger relationships. We also want it to be a great place for our church community and our partners where they can get away. They can book a room, book an RV site where you can be encouraged and get wisdom from friends and family and people around you. We're also gonna to continue to do our youth camps and our teen events. Like I said, we've done that for over 20 years. And guess what? Pastor Gary and Dorinda have been doing that for over 20 years where they would always make sure they, they made time to be there to pray for the youth, to speak into their life. Because we know even the statistics show that young adults, that youth that go to a youth camp are much more likely to continue in their faith long-term. So we don't wanna downplay the importance. It's not babysitting. These aren't kids events. This is a time for the Holy Spirit to speak to our young people. One event that I loved as a kid, and we haven't done this in many years because we haven't been able to find a place really that could host it, and that is the father-son camping trip. We would go out and we'd spend some time in the woods. We would do a little bit of hunting. The father-son camping trip used to be a favorite. I'm so excited to bring some of these back and to have a home for some of these events. Now, something else that we're gonna do is we wanna host various retreats. We wanna host marriage retreats that people would be restored and encouraged in their marriages. We expect to have awesome men's retreats that men are encouraged in that what they are supposed to be doing for the kingdom, that men have a place that they can go in women's retreats, business retreats, Retreats for business owners and business leaders. We also want to do youth and young adult retreats. So these are like special events or different uh, speaking engagements or things that, that you can go and you can really be encouraged while you're there. Let me tell you a little bit about some of the activities that are at the property there. So we know there's an amazing swimming pool that's 35 by almost 80 feet that's heated. That's amazing. We have a full court uh, basketball court there. We have two sand volleyball courts. We have axe throwing, paintball. There's a gaga ball pit. 
There's several miles of hiking trails. There's softball and kickball fields. There's a nine square in the air. There's canoes. There's a playground with swings. There's tetherball, archery. There is so many different activities, and that's just to name a few of them. But for all ages, all generations to have a great time there. Now, let me tell you a little bit about where we are with some of the improvements. Now, we know there's a long list of improvements we want to see done, and currently, we are working on stabilizing the property. That means getting roofs replaced so they're not taking on any water, dealing with some moisture mitigation, working on drainage, and we'll be doing some painting and some cleaning to get the property stabilized right away. So that's just where we wanna start. We want to also do some aesthetic improvements and improve the function of the camp. Over the years, we know we're gonna keep using this camp for many years to come, and we want the siding to be great, the buildings to look better than they are. We wanna enlarge the lake that's there, and. We wanna add some activities and do some different things there, but we really want to have that great blend of aesthetic and function that this place really speaks of the excellence of the kingdom. Another great activity that we can host there is a campus location for Faith Life Church. We're so excited about all the possibilities. Now I wanna give you a little bit of an update on paying for it. As you know, these things, they do cost money and many of you have given up your time, talent, and treasure. So I'm truly appreciative Thank you so much. We believe that we're gonna have this camp paid for in no time at all. We're moving really quick with it. So thank you to everyone who's been giving. And I wanna encourage you to continue to give towards it, to support it, that it's paid for, that we can use it to support the kingdom. We're so excited about what the future has in store for this property and this location. Remember, it's a tool and we're gonna use it to glorify our Father in heaven. Thank you to everyone who has participated and is gonna to continue to participate in what God is doing at the campground. Amen, amen, yes, yes, awesome. Um, can you put the picture up of the camp? Rich, um, Rich, right here, Rich is in charge of the camp. Stand up, Rich. <laughs> Doing a great job. So Rich uh, had this picture made uh, this is kind of the finished product here. I mean, we're moving the road over. We got some things changed. The road on the left, you'll see above the. It's a four and a half acre lake. Nate is of all. He's helping us. Bless his heart. He's uh, he owns an excavating company. He's just like, you just give me the gas and I'll dig. You know, you'll dig the pond. It's like, I don't think he knew how big a pond we were digging. Maybe I don't know. But anyway, it's, it's a lake. It's four and a half acre lake, right? And uh, so you'll see we're going to build a lodge on top of that hill there, right above the lake, and there's a waterfall. Another one of our partners builds those for a living. That's what he does. He designs that, Dan Spaghetti. He's designing a waterfall down through there. So uh, when you saw the pictures with Pastor Tim, that was the rough version. That's the camp before he did anything to it. But we are committed to make it an, an, an excellence, an excellent camp, if not the best in central Ohio. It'll be an amazing camp. And so it's going to be totally awesome. Now, where we're at, we've had about 1.3 million come in already for the camp. So praise God. Give yourself a hand for that over PAL, everyone online. Thank you for that. Now, as you can understand, rehab at this property is, is not cheap. And so besides the purchase price, which we pay like 1.8 for the property, uh, we need, we figured probably another almost a million dollars to, br to bring everything where we want it. And uh, here's, here's why we're bringing it up today. This is spring, and summer is fast approaching. We would like to open the camp this year. And so we, we just want to get some funds in to finish up some of the basics and get it wrapped up, uh, maybe targeting July or something around there to get this camp open. Again, we thank all of you for this uh, project. This is not a youth camp. We'll have youth camps there. This is your camp. This is our partner's camp. Anywhere in the country, you can come in here and park your RV anytime you want to. This is your camp, and we have a, it'll be used from a lot of different kind of projects and things, but it is right close. It's right to Jellaway. If you look, find Jellaway on the map of Ohio, that's where it's at. It's out near Jellaway, which is right there in the Amish country, and so you're going you're gonna to enjoy the location. But anyway, I wanted to mention that as we receive our, our tithes and offerings today. Keep that in mind that uh, we are still receiving money. That's where we're at with the finances coming in. And so I wanted to let you know that. But we believe it is paid for. And it's going to be a great, uh, a great witness. We've had a lot of people reach out. Even corporations have reached out and asking if they can use it for their events. And by the way, the camp is designed to, have, to handle three different events at the same time. 
So it can be used different ways, uh, all kinds of things. I appreciate Rich designing that. Uh, Rich has really been the mastermind of a lot of this with his uh, bride and many other people. Suela, she's over here. This girl drives from Detroit once a week. For, <laughs> she drives from Detroit. You think your drive to church is long. She drives from Detroit and home every week for church. But she comes down to help on the camp uh, for days and days. I mean, she's led a team over there. It's been amazing. I don't want to miss anyone, but I appreciate all of the, the volunteers, people that are the dream teamers that are doing that. So stand with me today as we give today. And if you're giving to the camp, just make a notation on your giving that this goes to the camp over at Power Online. And we certainly appreciate it. I mean, great things happening. But let's focus our attention on what God says, okay? That's what does God say? What does God say? And he says this, and I say it every week in 2 Corinthians 9. God gives, you can quote it by now, God gives seed to the sower and bread for the eating. So you have no fear. The fear is you're going to do without, right? If I give. Just the opposite. And he's going to increase your store of seed. He's going to increase your influence that you'll have... Uh, be made rich in every way that you can have all that you need, but then also you can be generous on every occasion. Friend, that is powerful. People respond to generosity. Generosity goes right to the heart. It breaks the walls down. People, like I did with my dad today, they respond with gratefulness when you are generous. So God wants us to touch people with generosity. That requires money, and he wants to get that in your hands. So lay your hand on your giving today. If it's either by check or by device, you'll see on the screen how to give by device. And let's say this together again. Let's believe what God says. God gives, say it with me, God gives seed to the sower, bread for the eating, and he'll increase my seed. That's what he says, that I may be able to be generous on every occasion. That's what he says. That's what I say. That's what I have in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, it's been a great day as we leave today. Remember, praise and worship. Praise and worship. Who is God in your life? Who is God in your life? How big is he? You know, just spend some time walking around outside. The Bible says that even creation declares the glory of God. Spend some time meditating at the stars, thinking of creation. It's like, oh my goodness, God, you are awesome. You can definitely handle my problem. His word gives you that promise. We'll see you next week. Pal, see you next time. Online, see you next time. Have a great week. Our prayer team's up here. I bless you in the name of Jesus. You are anointed for this hour, this generation. No fear. Go out and take territory. See you next week.